Good evening, Central family. Uh, nice to be with you tonight. Uh, hope you've had a good good day. And, uh, again, just, just good to be here. I wanted to take a, a minute and update you, uh, just kind of reiterate what we're going to do this coming Sunday. And uh, so first thing is, just want to just, I guess, reiterate, reassure, if, if you are not um, comfortable joining us on Sunday for whatever health concerns you might have, whether they be for your own health or for those of other family members here. We just want to assure you that's, that, that's fine and we all understand. And we just encourage you to continue to enjoy, uh, join us uh, via live stream. Things are going to be very consistent, just like they have been. We're, we're, we're basically live streaming uh, in a very similar format, but we'll just have people joining us here in the auditorium. So if you're able to join us, we're, we're excited and hope that you will. Uh, but we're going to follow very much the same format. So I just wanted to take a minute and kind of kind of lay that out so that you had an idea of what to expect. Again, when we come in uh, on Sunday, the doors will be open. We'll have each one of our entrances open to provide plenty of space for people to kind of move in and out. We'll have the individual Lord's Supper communion uh, servings out so that you can just pick up one we ask you to just pick up one when you come in so that you'll be ready for uh, for the lord's supper uh, we'll also have a collection uh, box uh, when you exit so uh, we won't be passing trays and uh, the other thing is mask mask are optional we're not requiring mask uh, but if you uh, are more comfortable wearing one certainly uh, we uh, encourage that Probably the harder thing to do is like not like not contact. Um, that's just not who we are. Uh, we we shake hands and we hug and and we enjoy seeing one another. We're gonna obviously try to keep our distance, so those things you know we won't be doing those things. But um, again, look forward to seeing you Sunday, and I hope you can join us. Uh, we have uh, Luke and uh, Slate come up here. They're gonna have have our study tonight, and uh, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. Appreciate it, man. All right. Well, we may be experiencing some te technical difficulties. We may not be in sync as far as what we're saying and how our mouth is moving and, and so forth. So if you have to, uh, just kind of look away. You don't have to look at the screen. You can always listen. But we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and I uh, just want to welcome everyone tonight. Thanks for tuning in. We are so glad to have you a part of this study tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for being such an amazing God. Father, we thank you for your beautiful plan of salvation, for sending Jesus. Jesus, we're so grateful that you willingly gave up your life for us, and we are so thankful uh, that you sent the Holy Spirit to dwell among us, uh, to help us, empower us, to have the strength to overcome sin. And Father, um, again, we are so grateful for all that you do, especially for your Word um, that strengthens us, builds us up, and helps us as well to become everything you want us to be. And Father, we pray this prayer in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, last week we began a study on the book of Hebrews called The Best Just Got Better. And anytime we do a study of a book of the Bible, there are several questions that we like to ask first so that we begin to understand the context right. of what's being said. Some of those questions would be who wrote it, who was it written to, why was it written, uh, when it was written, the culture in which it was written. And so we kind of addressed those things last week. But for our viewers who may not have been able to tune in last week, Luke, if you would, just kind of give us a recap. Sure, absolutely. So last week we discussed some of the major points regarding the book of Hebrews. We talked about who the author might be. You suggested Paul. I told you you're wrong. It's Luke, but we're not. No, we're not I was right. We're not going right. to get into that again this week. We're not going to get into that. Um, then we talked about whatever it was 
written. Uh, we offered a window for whenever we would suggest it being. Um, I think the window that we gave was 64 AD to yeah. early 70 AD. And our reasoning behind this is because the way that we read the book of Hebrews, it seems as if the temple is still intact, which we know was destroyed in 70 AD. Right. Um, then we describe the culture and what it would have been like at that time for Christians. Remember, Nero and his ruthless ruling began in 64 AD. So these Christians would have been under some severe persecution. We talked about the pressure that you would be under and the temptations to disown God that this kind of persecution would bring. Right, and, and not just from outside sources like uh, the Roman government, but also from within uh, their, their own people. Right. I mean, there were still Jews who did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, and so they also were persecuting the believers. Right. I mean, their world literally was turned upside down. There's no more temple, no more priests, no more sacrifices. And the writer of Hebrews really had to be careful that he didn't portray this letter in a 13 chapters of in your face kind of thing, you know? Right. And so we talked about the purpose of this letter and why it was written to encourage the struggling believers during this heavy persecution. And what a challenge that that must have been for the Hebrew writer, right. whoever it was, trying to encourage people under these circumstances. And then finally, we discussed what this letter means to us as Christians today. Even though we don't have gods made of wood or of stone, we still elevate certain things like our electronics, like our money, even people, celebrities, to the same level or even higher than God. And so as we go through this study, what we want to do is we want to take a step back. We want to reevaluate ourselves and let go of some of those things that we may be holding at that same level as God, rivaling His place. Um, last week you mentioned the drifting analogy and how we can slowly grow apart from God right. without even realizing it. And that is so dangerous. And we talked a little bit about how dangerous that that can be. But when it all boils down to it, Christ is better. So much better. And it's not even worth dipping your foot into the current to have the slightest chance of being swept away. But overall, we want the message of every single lesson in this series to be the same. We want it to build. Tonight, we're going to start with Christ being better than the angels. Next week, we're going to talk about him being better than their former leaders, how he's better than the priests, how he's a better covenant, and then finally, to him being a better sacrifice. And like we mentioned last week, by the end of this series, five, six weeks, whatever it's going to be, we want to be able to be sitting at the top of this metaphorical ladder, and we want to be able to look back on how far that Christ has carried us. Absolutely. And, you know, tonight... We're dealing with angels and how Christ, how Jesus is greater than the angels. And right. I think where we need to start is by first, first of all, answering the question, what is an angel? Are there different types of angels? Do they have different types of abilities? And so I'm just going to kind of pass that to you, Luke. I bet you so are. If you will. Can I decline uh, it? <laughs> no, you can't. You okay. have to deal with that. All right. So uh, talk to us. I can't about pick just one of them. Angels. No, you okay. can't. All right. That's an extremely loaded question. It is. It is. But we're appreciate you giving me this one. No Although um, angels are described in many different ways, they're essentially spiritual beings that are created by God, believed to act as attendants, agents, or messengers of God. Conventionally, we see them represented in human form with wings and a long white robe, but we know from Revelation that they can take on just about any different right. form, there shape. Is. Exactly. And we know that um, from Ezekiel that angels can travel at top speeds, and we're just getting started. Right. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of angels. And millions. we're only, millions, we're only gonna mention 10 tonight, but I promise it's still gonna make your head spin. So get your pins ready and fasten your seat belts because we're about to fly. The first one is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is an entity all of itself. It's repeated several different times throughout scripture, um, not just the New Testament, not just the Old Testament, but sprinkled in throughout both of them. You probably recognize the name because it shows up 65 times wow. in the Bible. The purpose of the angel of the Lord varies from passage to passage. He's not a messenger angel, but he delivers messages. He isn't the angel of death, but he sure can be. Right. It's almost as if he's the Lord's right-hand man. Um, when there's something super important that God needs to get done and he needs to know that it's gonna be done right, this is your guy. The angel of the Lord is the guy. We see him sitting on top of the empty tomb after the resurrection in Matthew 28 too. 
He strikes the head of King Herod and kills him in Acts 12, 23. He opens up the prison cell for all of the apostles to escape in Acts 5, 19. And on two separate occasions, he strikes down 185,000 Assyrians in Isaiah 37, 36 and 2 Kings 19, 35. You do not want to get on this no. guy's bad side. Oh, no, he's a beast. Not at all. The second one that we're going to talk about is the cherubim. Now, although we're unsure of the exact purpose of the cherubim, we can most likely assume that they're kind of a biblical bouncer, if you will, kind of like bodyguards for special places or items. The first time that we see the cherubim is actually in Genesis, uh, standing outside the Garden of Eden to protect the Tree of Life in Genesis 3.24. They also guard things like Solomon's Temple, the Covenant, and the Tabernacle. They're actually engraved on on each of those things, right. the images of the cherubim. Um, but most often we hear them in the same sentence with the seraphim, which is our next angel. The Bible describes the seraphim as winged fiery passion for doing God's good work. They're then described in Isaiah chapter 6 as oh, having passage. six wings. Isaiah 6, 1 through 3 is the Lord all-powerful. His glory fills the whole earth. They're considered to be under the division of divine messengers, but not really. Their message literally shakes buildings and fills it with smoke. So just imagine this wow. with me tonight, okay? So just imagine we're here delivering this, this class, and the walls start shaking around us. The room fills up with smoke, and this, this white-faced figure starts descending from above, and he's got six wings, and in a loud voice, he's like, hey, hey, don't worry. Don't be afraid. It's okay. I got good news for you. Right. I mean, that's just terrifying. And, and that's the thing. You know, so oftentimes when people would encounter angels in Scripture, it was this moment of terror. Right. Right? I mean, they're, they're falling to the ground in fear. And, I mean, you think about the seraphim. <laughs> that would be pretty scary. Yeah. The smoke and everything shaking. Yeah. I mean, that would... That'd be a scary situation. Yeah, they definitely have the right to, to be afraid. Um, the next thing that we're going to mention is archangels. So the New Testament makes references to over a hundred different angels, but uses the word archangel only twice. And we see it mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 when it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we see it appear again in Jude 1, 9. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputed among, with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So we see so that he is he's under the blanket of the archangel, but he's pretty special. So we're going to give him his own category. So we're right. going to talk about Michael next. And that's pretty cool. You know, they're not just spiritual beings. I mean, they've got names. Yeah. And so, you know, again, you're fixing to talk about Michael, who was an archangel. That's, right. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Michael is mentioned three times in the Bible. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, Daniel experiences a vision after he went through a period of fasting. In Daniel 10, 13 through 21, Daniel's vision is of an angel who identifies himself as Michael, the protector. Daniel is then informed that Michael arise during the time of the end in Daniel 12 verse 1. He's then briefly mentioned again in the book of Revelation and it describes this war in heaven between Michael and Satan. And Michael, cool passage, yeah, man. Michael being more powerful than Satan defeats him. And after this conflict, Satan is then thrown to the earth along with all of the other fallen angels where the ancient serpent called the devil still tries to lead the whole world astray. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. Um, so we're only given the names of three angels right. in the entire Bible, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. So Gabriel is another archangel, if you will, um, a messenger angel. We see him twice, actually, in the same chapter, Luke chapter 1, when he tells Zechariah that his wife Elizabeth will have a son and then appears to Mary to tell her that she will give birth to Christ. Right. Whew. All right. Now, really quickly, because I'm very tired of talking, so let's hit the highlights. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> I'm that. I'm so glad you took this, oh, yeah. this portion. Me too. 
Common angels. Several times throughout scripture, it just mentions an angel, uh, not any specific kind of angel. Sometimes they're delivering a message. Sometimes it's a vision. Sometimes they're helping someone. But these angels are basically just doing what God created them to do, to, right. to do his bidding. We also have ministering angels, angels that come to comfort and attend to people. We know that a lot of angels come to take care of him in the desert in right. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 7. And we know that they came and administered to Jesus after he'd been tempted by Satan in Mark 1, 13, and also strengthened Christ in the garden in Luke 22, 43. Whew, death angels. We're not done yes. yet. The death angels or the destroying angels are mentioned in the Bible as an entity sent out by God on several different occasions to kill and destroy. Of all the of all the angels you've been talking about, yeah. this is the one I don't want to see. Yeah, okay. I definitely, definitely not. <laughs> Luckily, we're on his side. Right, absolutely. In 2 Samuel 24, 15, he kills the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In 1 Chronicles 21, 15, the same angel is seen by David standing between earth and heaven with a drawn sword in his hand stretched out against Jerusalem. And later in 2 Kings 19 through 35, this is the angel that kills 185,000 men of Sennacherib's Assyrian army, thereby saving Hezekiah's Jerusalem. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to see I don't want to see the death angel. No, definitely not. And finally, fallen angels. Fallen angels are essentially angels who chose to go against the will of God and what he said. And we know that when Satan fell, he took a third of the angels in heaven with right. him, Revelation 12, verse 4. But they're still extremely powerful. Demons, as we call them now, I mean, they, they possess people, they cause all sorts of illnesses, and they harm good people. Right. Um, Revelation 12, again, I'll just mention it. It describes this battle between the angels and the fallen angels. Whew. That was a lot to process. You did good. You did good, man. Uh, you guys' pens are probably on I'm, fire I'm at home. I'm glad you, you took that. Yeah, I bet you are. And uh, listen, let me say this for those of you at home. Um, as soon as we can, we will try and post a lot of this information that Luke just shared with you so that you can go back and study it on your own. I know it was you know, very hard to, to kind of keep up and write, you know, and we want you to be able to go back and study this if you want to. It was hard for me to keep up. Well, you did good. Well, we mentioned 10 angels tonight, um, but we're not even close to mentioning all of them. Like I said earlier, there are thousands upon thousands of different types of angels. And here's the thing, those are only the ones that God has allowed humans to know. Right. There's no way for us to know how many angels that God has actually created. I mean, essentially what we're looking at here is God's Avengers, his handcrafted team that his he army. has created to save the world and to do his bidding. And you're telling me that after everything that you've heard and I've described, that Christ is better. Yeah, I mean, I loved your description of the angels, that they are powerful and they can do amazing things. But yes, Jesus is greater than even the angels. So tell us then, how do we know that Jesus is better than the angels? Well, it's not going to come from me. I'm just going to let the book of Hebrews do the talking. And this is the beauty of this book because we we learn so much about Jesus in, in this particular uh, book or, or letter. But let me just share a few things with you that the Hebrew writer says about Jesus and how he is better than the angels. First of all, he talks about the name that was given to Jesus. Right. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. This is what the Hebrew writer says. This shows that the Son of that the Son is far greater. Not just greater. Right. He is far greater than the angels. Just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. And of course, we've already looked at a couple of the names of the angels, Gabriel, Michael, Lucifer, right. but Jesus, his name is in a class all its own. Right. And if you look at its meaning, the name Jesus means Savior. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, as the angel Gabriel is announcing to Joseph that Mary is going to be giving birth to Jesus, this is what he says. You will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so Jesus means Savior. Uh, Peter goes on to write, or say rather, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, he says, There is no salvation in anyone else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save them. And then we could also add Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, 
where it says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven. Of course, that would include the angels. Right. And on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so this shows just through his name alone. Right that he is greater than the angels. Right, and you know, I think of James 2.19 where just at the name of Jesus, even the demons, the fallen angels, the yes. one who knew God and decided to turn away from him, the fallen angels tremble just at the name. Just at the name of Jesus. Um, also, Jesus has a special relationship with God, and, and it is greater than the relationship that the angels have with God. If right. you look at verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 1, it says, For God never said to any angel what he said to Jesus, You are my son. Right. And he says, Today I have become your father. He goes on to say, I will be his father, and he will be my son. Now, the angels were created by God, but they do not have that father-son relationship right. that Jesus has with the Father. Also, the angels of God worship Jesus. Looking at Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, they worship Him as God. It says, And when He brought His supreme Son into the world, God said, Let all of God's angels worship Him. And the book of Revelation, uh, John gives us some insight as to what that worship is like. In Revelation 5, 11 through 13, it says, Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands, thousands. and millions, millions of angels around the throne, and of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. But not only do the angels worship Jesus, they serve right. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Psalm chapter 104, verse 4, uh, making reference to the angels, it says, The winds are your messengers, flames of fire. And again, this is reference to the angels. Flames of fire are your servants. Right. Yeah. Um, also, if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, it says, but the angels are only servants. They are spirits sent from God to care for those who will receive salvation. And so the angels, they do not command as Jesus does. Right. They yep. only obey. They worship him as God and they serve him as, as God. Um, also, the father said said things to his son that he never said to the angels. We've already looked at one from verse 5, you're my son and I'm your father. But if you keep reading in verses 8 through 12 of Hebrews chapter 1, it says, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O God... Your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. And so the Father says of the Son, just as John makes mention in John chapter 1, also as Paul makes mention in Colossians chapter 1, that Jesus is God. Right. Um, he talks about how he has a throne and he rules, and the angels, they do not rule. They're, they're not God. But he goes on to write, he also says to the Son, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hand. In other words, Jesus was a part of creation. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 2, down to the latter part of verse 2, it says, And through the Son he made the universe 
and created everything in it. And so Jesus is not only God, he is creator. Now the angels, according to Psalm chapter 148 verses 2 through 5, they are created beings. They were created by Jesus. Right. And so we know that creation is not greater than the creator. And so Jesus, in that regard, is far greater. But then one last thing that I'll mention, um, the Hebrew writer says he sits at the right hand of the Father. Verse 13 now of Hebrews chapter 1, And God never said to any of the angels, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. And so this shows that Jesus holds the very top position because no angel sits at the right hand of God. Yeah. In fact, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, Now Christ has gone into heaven of honor next to God, all the angels and authorities and powers are bowing down before him. And so again, Jesus is far greater. And I know we talk about how amazing these angels are, but Jesus is far greater than that. Let's kind of shift gears. Okay. And um, I'm going to throw this question back at you, Luke. Um, why, why would this be important for... Uh, the people during this letter to understand and hear. So somehow, thinking about the angels had gotten way out of hand, not just to the church that Hebrews was written to, but also others. Galatians tells us that there were actually angels that were preaching a different gospel than Paul's. Uh, he warns them in Galatians 1, 8 through 9, he says, We preach to you the good news, so if we ourselves, or even if an angel from heaven should preach to you something different, we should be judged guilty. I said it before, and I say it now again, you have already accepted the good news. If anyone is preaching something different to you, let that person be judged guilty. And even though Paul has already warned the churches about these angels and how they can be corrupt, there's still some churches, like the church in Colossae, that worships angels. Colossians 2.18 says, Do not let anyone disqualify you by making you humiliate yourself and worship angels. Such people enter into visions, which fill them with foolish pride because of their human way of thinking. So these believers had started to drift, and this is the writer's way of trying to pull them back in by reminding them of how great the angels are, but just how much better that Christ is. Not only in of himself, but also how much better that he is like than the angels. Absolutely. So uh, now that we know what it meant for them, why don't you tell us what it means for us? Why is this important to us today? Well, there are some people today um, who believe that Jesus was an angel himself, that he was a created being. In other words, that Jesus is on the same level with the angels, and that's a concept that degrades his glory and points out all the reasons why for, for the fact that Jesus is far greater than the angels. Uh, but also, you know, I think today there's, there's an infatuation definitely with angels. Um, there's all kind of movies, there's all kinds of books and TV shows about angels. People love to buy angel figurines and they love to talk about guardian angels. And, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with those things, but if we're not careful, we can then we I mean, even the angels themselves, when people would encounter angels, they would fall down at times in fear and they would begin to worship them and the angels would always say, no, 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 don't worship us. You know, worship God and, and God alone. And I think that can be a very real temptation for us today, Yeah, you know, to worship God. I mean, to worship angels. Yeah. Uh, maybe even pray to angels. But... 
the fact of the matter is Jesus is better. Yeah. He's he's greater than the angels and I think the Hebrew writer is helping us to understand that so that we can understand that Jesus is better than anyone or anything. I mean, like you and I have talked, the angels were probably his greatest creation. At least his most powerful. At least his most powerful. And Jesus is far greater than that. So then answer this question for me. If Jesus is far greater than the angels, then what does it mean that he made himself lower than the angels? Why would he make himself lower than the angels? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and we really get into that in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verse 6. This is the verse that Luke's alluding to. I'll read it for you. It says, For a little while, referring to Jesus, you made him lower than the angels. Now, one of the things that we have to understand is that angels are greater than mankind. Right. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, they live in heaven. They're very powerful. Those who serve God, they are holy. I mean, they, they stand in His presence and, and serve Him. And so they're greater than mankind. But here's the deal. For a short period of time, Jesus chose to become human. Right, and, and I think probably most of us understand why. He chose to become human for us. Right. So that he could be sacrificed for our sins. Um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 12, this is what Paul writes. And he's, he's really talking about Christ, um, his, his attitude. I mean, for him to do this, I mean, you think about what Jesus gave up to become human. Absolutely. I mean, he had to humble himself he, he came to this sin-filled world. He left paradise. I mean, he totally humbled himself. But listen, listen to what Paul says. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, though he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now, as we get a little bit further into Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 14 through 15, the Hebrew writer is going to explain why Jesus had to become a human. Let me read that for you. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For, here's the reason why, for only as a human being could he die. Right. Jesus was immortal. He's God. Yeah. And so he had to take the form of a human. He had to become mortal so that he could die for our sins. And only by dying, he says, could he break the power of the devil who had the power over death. And so, man... This just really shows you how great Jesus really is. Right. Because Jesus humbled himself. Now, of course, the Bible says that when we humble ourselves from God, he does what? He exalts us. He, he, exalts us. Yeah. he lifts us up. And that's exactly what he did with Jesus. If you finish Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 12, where it talks about how Christ humbled himself. He was in obedience to God. He uh, died on the cross. This is how Paul finishes that up. He says, Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so Jesus was exalted, even though for a time he was made a little lower than the angels. But Jesus is far greater than the angels. I think that's all the time we've got. Uh, Luke, you want to tell them what we're going to be studying? Just remind them what we're going to be studying next week. Sure. So this week, obviously, we talked about how Jesus is greater than the angels. Next week, we're going to be talking about how Christ is better than their former leaders. 
And if you thought that this was a shock to the Hebrews, this next one, yeah. this is really going to turn them upside down. The angels was more of a modern thing than worshiping angels, but, I mean, you think about how highly that they held up Abraham. Yeah. And just, just really how... Weird of much of a shock that they're going to be in when they find out that Christ is much, much better than Abraham, Moses. Moses. Yeah, absolutely. this is this is going to be absolutely huge. Yeah. Well, we're out of time um, for our central family. There's not going to be a Zoom meeting tonight. We're going to be meeting this coming Sunday for those of you who are able, and so we hope to, to see you then. But let's close out with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. Father, we thank you for your word so that we can know you better. And Father, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus on our behalf to die for our sins. And Father, we just pray that as your people, we pray that we'll go out and share the message of Jesus with everyone we come in contact with. And we pray this prayer in the power of Jesus' name. Amen.